Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining this webinar. We'll go ahead and get started now. Um, today, we're going to be sharing some new research examining stakeholder perspectives on the local benefits and burdens of large scale solar deployment in the United States. Um, just a few quick housekeeping items before we really dive into the content here. Um, you may have noticed that you've all joined in muted only mode. But of course, we do want to hear from you. So please do submit any questions you have via the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we'll be certainly monitoring the question and answer uh, window throughout the presentation as any questions come up. And we can uh, quickly answer any kind of smaller technical questions. But we'll save the larger content-oriented questions for a Q&A period that we'll have at the end of the presentation. So. I think we should have 15 or 20 minutes toward the end uh, for some open Q&A, so looking forward to that too. Uh, I will also note, uh, as you may have just heard, this presentation is being recorded. Um, and that recording, as well as the actual slides uh, making up the bulk of this presentation, uh, will be shared with all webinar registrants and participants. So, of course, those of you on the call and anyone who's already registered, will make sure to send those links out directly to you. And we'll also be posting a video recording of the webinar uh, to the landing page for this report that we're presenting about today. Um, and actually, I would ask uh, my colleague Ben Hohen to go ahead and share that landing page and some other relevant links into the, the chat. So you can see those there. Uh, you can always find more information about uh, this report, and eventually you'll be able to find the webinar recording at that landing page, too. Uh, Doug, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I first want to express our gratitude to the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, Solar Energy Technologies Office, who provided the funding for us to execute this research. And we certainly couldn't have done it without their support, so uh, we thank them for that. And a quick disclaimer here as well, the research that we are presenting today does not necessarily represent the views of the United States government uh, or the University of California, but rather these are the views of the research team and the authors of this report. Next slide. So here's a quick rundown of what you'll hear about in today's presentation. Um, so I'm going to be kicking things off. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of a background about the research uh, and the larger portfolio of research in which this particular project is situated. Um, but you'll mostly hear from the lead author of this, uh, this report in the paper, uh, Doug Bassett, who has joined me here today. Uh, Doug is from Michigan State University. And he'll walk you through the detailed methods and, and the results from this new analysis. Um, let's go to the next slide. And one more. So starting just with a bit of background about the this project as a whole. Um, now most of you on the call today are probably well aware that solar uh, is one of the fastest growing new electric generating resources in the United States today. Um, and that growth that we've been seeing in the past couple of years is actually expected to accelerate with more and more uh, solar capacity installed each year. Last year in 2023, I think we installed around 30 gigawatts of, of new solar capacity in the US. Um, and by all accounts, we're estimated to install you know, between 30 and 60 gigawatts each year between now and 2035 and possibly beyond. Now, to be clear, the vast majority of this new solar capacity will be in the form of what we call large-scale solar um, or utility-scale solar. For this project, we've defined that as any project with a uh, rated capacity of one megawatt or greater, uh, although definitions of utility-scale solar certainly vary, but for the purpose of this research, we're looking and examining um, projects larger than one megawatt. Of course, those projects can range all the way up to five or even 800 megawatts, um, and, and we are seeing larger and larger plants installed each year. Now, the reason for this research uh, and the motivation for us is that, of course, this rapid expansion of, of solar uh, uh, infrastructure has impacts, both benefits and burdens, on the communities hosting these large-scale solar plants and related infrastructure. And increasingly, researchers, community representatives, and other stakeholders are really emphasizing the need to align the planning, development, and operation of these projects 
with the values, priorities, and concerns of the local communities that are hosting them. And so the research that we're presenting today is part of a broader research portfolio, which really attempts to unpack how that might be done successfully. Um, it is a project we're calling Community Centered Solar Development or CCSD. Uh, next slide. So here's a bit of background about the CCSD project as a whole. And I think uh, Ben just dropped a link to our uh, the full CCSD web uh, site, web project page. Now this project as a whole is comprised of six interdisciplinary and interlinked tasks uh, through mixed methods approaches. Task one is the focus of today. Uh, that's the case study analysis. Uh, we conducted interviews around seven existing large-scale solar sites to uncover key stakeholder perceptions, as well as the factors that influence those perceptions. In task two, we conducted a nationally representative survey of uh, almost a thousand residents living within three miles of large-scale solar plants to examine attitudes and perceptions at a broader empirical scale. Uh, and that research will be released uh, really in the coming weeks and months. Uh, task three conducts rigorous econometric analysis to examine tax income and employment impacts of large scale solar. Uh, in task four, we've partnered with the US Geological Survey, USGS, to produce a public database and web map application with detailed location and specification data on all large scale solar plants across the United States. So I encourage you to check out the US PV database if you haven't already seen that. And then in task five, we are conducting proactive planning and visioning activities with potential future large scale solar host communities to help them plan for how to align uh, those projects and their developments uh, accordingly. And finally, task six sort of ties all of this research together by conducting outreach and dissemination for all the work. Uh, and that includes the webinar that you're attending now. Uh, next slide. So finally, uh, before I pass it over to Doug, I want to highlight the full CCSD research team. Uh, we're just really fortunate uh, to work with this excellent team of researchers that's shown here on the left side of this slide. Uh, so along with my collaborators at Berkeley Lab, uh, Ben Hohen and Robbie Nilsson are joining me today. Um, we have partners and, and research team members from the University of Michigan. Michigan State University, including Doug Bassett, who you'll hear from in just a moment, uh, USGS, NREL, University of Connecticut, and American University. In addition to this actual research team that's doing the work, we have an extraordinary technical advisory committee uh, with representatives from the organizations shown here on the right. Uh, as you can see from these logos, our technical advisory committee includes representatives from energy justice organizations, universities, um, extension agencies, project developers, and urban and rural county organizations. So it's a pretty diverse group, as you can see, um, and they offer really important insights and feedback to uh, help our research design and activities. And with that, let me go ahead and pass the mic over to Professor Doug Bissett from Mich uh, Univers uh, sorry, Michigan State to present about this case study research under task one. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. And thanks for the introduction. And thanks to so many of you for attending. And I also wanted to uh, extend my uh, thanks and appreciation to everybody that made this research possible, CEDO, uh, as well as the interview participants that uh, that I spoke with over the course of the work. All right, so let's get started. Uh, I wanted to start by making a case for case studies. Um, they're not always universally supported or even necessarily respected uh, by some researchers, uh, but they are especially effective in examining complexity, uniqueness, and in particular, causal relationships. They are comprehensive, typically qualitative descriptions of a particular case, and what they're uniquely adept at is capturing the subjective experience of individuals which is tricky to do in surveys and honestly tricky to do in a lot of different quantitative research methods. We often use case studies to refine our concepts, to, to, excuse me, to derive hypotheses and to explore causal relationships. Additionally, one of the goals of task one, as Joe said, was to inform a more representative survey of solar neighbors that we would deploy in task two. And our case studies were to identify themes that we would then examine in far more projects and with more participants in that survey. Though understanding that we wouldn't be able to reach the depth of the responses or the analysis that we're able to hear in task one. 
So two research questions really drove these case studies. First, what are residents' most common concerns regarding solar across states, site types, landscapes, and ownership structures? And second, what strategies have developers and officials and residents employed or could employ to improve perceptions and project outcomes and better align solar development with local land use plans, community needs, and values? So how could we ensure we included a diverse set of sites? So based on our own experience, discussions with our technical advisory committee, and a review of the literature, we developed a list of factors that describe different types of solar sites. We distinguished these factors as either key factors that were crucial for us to differentiate across, and ideally differentiated factors, which were not immediately apparent or we couldn't assess from the outside and may only be better understood after we began our research. For instance, we knew we wanted to include at least one greenfield, one agrivoltaic, one super four, excuse me, one super fun, or one brownfield project. We also knew that we wanted to include a variety of different permitting authorities, so local, state, and hybrid authority. However, when we talk about ideally differentiated factors, it wasn't immediately clear, for example, how many and what types of meetings took place in these communities. And it would simply be too difficult to review hundreds of sites and understand the meeting processes for each one. So we knew we would only learn more about that after we began each case study. So we began examining sites in a number of different ways. We talked to subject matter experts and asked for the recommendations. We did a number of media keyword searches using the site selection criteria that I identified in that last slide. We tracked national news stories that focused on either unique or maybe successful development processes. And we reviewed a number of existing data sets and relevant GIS mapping tools, including the ones listed here. The first two were especially helpful for identifying agrivoltaic projects and for identifying projects that existed either in Justice 40 communities or adjacent to those communities. Over the course of a few months, we reviewed over 125 individual sites for potential inclusion in the study, and we slowly whittled that list down based on our key factors and our ideally differentiated factors. At the end of that process, 15 sites were selected and presented to our technical advisory committee. And through discussion, we ultimately selected seven sites to make up our sample of case studies. I should also add that we, we did do a lot of Google earthing and investigating projects to see how many homes were nearby and whether or not there would be enough residents to interview. There were quite a few discussions where we think we had a perfect site and then we would look around it and only to find that there were no homeowners, there were no residences or apartment builders or anything nearby. And so it made the difficult, it made the research too difficult and we had to move on. On this slide, you can see some of the criteria describing our seven sites. You can see that there was one each in Michigan, Iowa, Rhode Island, Florida, Texas, Colorado, and Arizona. All of the sites were completed within the last five years, with the exception of one project that remains under construction currently. And I will say that we are withholding a number of details about each site because we want to protect our participants' confidentiality. For some of these sites, there was only one developer or perhaps one landowner or one local official, and they had an outsized role in the development or in, in the interview process, and we want to make sure we protect their identity. A number of the researchers on this team are experienced qualitative researchers and interviewers, and we relied on our own past work and a literature review of previous studies, many that relied on interviews, to develop our current interview protocol. We developed three linked interview protocols at the outset, one for residents, one for developers, and one for local officials. We eventually added a fourth protocol because those three didn't necessarily make sense for interviewing utility personnel, who we quickly learned had unique and important perspectives that we wanted to make sure we included. The protocols focused on participants' attitudes, the methods and effectiveness of different engagement and communication strategies, zoning and permitting, best practices, and then what actually inspired a lot of conversation were questions about what advice participants had for future development. We actually developed a list of five questions that we would ask participants if they said they only had five to 10 minutes to talk, and often what would end up happening is they would end up talking for much longer. We conducted our interviews in each of the seven locations in the summer and fall of 2022. Most of these interviews were done in person and on site, but there were some interviews that were completed over Zoom or telephone, or perhaps using Microsoft Team. 
There had been some concerns about whether people would be comfortable or perhaps forthright in virtual interviews, but we didn't experience any problems. And I think we can all agree that at this point, we're all relatively comfortable and familiar speaking over Zoom or Teams. And I think most of the interview participants felt the same way. Potential interviewees were identified using site maps and Google Earth. And for the most part, by just driving or walking around the sites and just stopping at everybody's houses and walking, and excuse me, and knocking on doors. By the end of our data collection period, we had conducted 54 interviews and contacted over 100 interview, or excuse me, inv individuals. And I should say that this does not count residents' doors. So there were countless individuals that either didn't answer the door or perhaps looked through the window and shoot us away or that we met but didn't care to speak with us after we explained what the project was about. You can see the majority of our interviewees were residents, followed by developers, followed by government, and followed by utility personnel. We spoke with one, excuse me, one individual from a community benefits organization and one landowner. Again, note that these interview counts are not associated with any particular site, and that, again, is intentional. We decided that it would be possible to identify the site based on the number of landowners and developers we spoke with. Uh, so again, we're trying to protect their identity and confidentiality here. So those interviews that we were able to record, we transcribed, and we took detailed notes for those interviews that were not recorded. Uh, it's important to note that with this kind of research, recording interviews is difficult. Meeting people for the first time and immediately asking them questions about their local project, which many of them were very emotional about, emotional about uh, wasn't conducive to recording. Uh, and so most of the interviews were not recorded, at least the in-person interviews were not recorded. We did take detailed notes during the interviews when possible uh, and when not possible, either due to the weather or the environment. Sometimes it was windy, sometimes it was raining. Uh, we would immediately write as many notes as possible immediately following the interview. There were also cases where residents didn't feel comfortable with us taking notes. And so we would just have to do our best to remember everything they said. And then, uh, uh, and then honestly, after the interview was closed, I would walk around the corner and get in the car and immediately write down as much as I could from the interview. Interview notes and transcriptions were all analyzed thematically, which involves systematically organizing, identifying, and deriving themes to provide meaning across interviewees' responses. We then discussed these interview results with the project team and our technical advisory committee and iteratively revised themes as we moved from our initial sites to our later sites. We, we identified themes that were important that we wanted to make sure we followed up on as we moved to the next sites. So let's get to our actual case study results. Any, I, I just want to say anytime you see a number next to one of the quotations, that is simply to identify who said what but those numbers are randomly assigned and not associated with any site or the order in which interviews were conducted. So if you see an early number, it doesn't mean that came from an early interview or a late number, it doesn't mean it came from a late interview. The quotations and interview numbers provided are also not intended to be exhaustive. They are simply meant to be illustrative here. Some of the quotations I will read, many of them I will not. Let's start with research question one. What are residents' most common concerns regarding large-scale solar systems across states, site types, landscapes, and ownership structures? As we analyzed our interviewees' responses, we noted two themes present throughout. That concerns were most often associated with either interviewees' perceptions of development processes or the project's impacts. Participants' process concerns focused on the amount and the adequacy of the information disseminated, community members' ability to influence and their understanding of project attributes, and the efficacy of community subscription efforts. Participants' impact concerns focused on the direct and indirect economic impacts associated with large-scale solar development, the visual and landscape impacts of that development, as well as its environmental, excuse me, as well as its environmental impacts and the impacts associated with the rural-urban divide, which I'll explain and talk about a little bit more later. Uh, so let's start with our participants' process concerns. The first and one of the most common concerns associated with the process of solar development had to do with determining the right amount and the effectiveness of information disseminated to local residents and the challenge associated with communicating effectively with residents that live far apart in rural areas that have low density for the most part. Additionally, we noted a hesitancy by developers and officials to use the internet to communicate information based on concerns about how that information would be used and frankly misused by groups online. 
As this official in Texas notes, it didn't seem to matter how many meetings or how many people attended meetings, there would always be residents who claimed they hadn't been notified about the project. We also noted that whether or not residents had been offered compensation tended to impact whether they felt they had been adequately informed. Those that had been compensated felt that the notification process was sufficient, while those who had not been offered compensation often argued that they hadn't been sufficiently communicated with. Maybe not a huge surprise. Also throughout the process, it seemed relatively clear that the required processes, meaning public notice requirements, town halls, community meetings, and signage were not sufficient for raising awareness of solar projects. Quite a few participants identified that they didn't know a project was under development, excuse me, until construction began. Even one resident in Arizona, excuse me, in Arizona identified, all they have to do is put an alert in the newspaper, who reads the newspaper? This kind of reminds me of when I was young, and if you can believe it, I was actually a very quiet and shy kid, and, and my mom would tell me, if people can't hear you say you're sorry, then you didn't say it. And I think that lesson applies here as well. Importantly, residents repeatedly noted preferring direct engagement with developers rather than listening to presentations in formal town halls or reading written, excuse me, reading written notices. While developers and officials identified that low population density made this type of communication and strategy difficult, residents that engaged one-on-one -on -one with developers tended to perceive positive, excuse me, tended to perceive projects more positively than those that didn't. Additionally, it may be that these residents felt that they had more opportunities for feedback. And importantly, early oppor earlier opportunities, whether or not their feedback was acted upon and thus perceived projects more favorably. I want to actually take this opportunity to note one conversation I had with a Latin American couple in Arizona. They were very upset about the local project, which they could see from their front porch. But after speaking with me for about a half hour, they appeared visibly relieved. And in talking, they explicitly stated that this was the first time that they had been offered an opportunity to talk with somebody about how they felt about the project. And they literally said it was like therapy. It was a therapeutic experience for them. Early and direct engagement is important because residents repeatedly noting, noted desiring opportunities to influence project design elements. These elements could include the types and placement of fencing, what types of vegetative screening and buffers were used, setback distances, as well as the placement and visual impact of substation infrastructure. Now we note that that last one would be especially difficult to open up to public debate, but we just wanted to note it here. At the same time, it was clear that residents who had their feedback ignored perceived projects and developers and officials more negatively. There was one particular case in which an adjacent landowner and cattle rancher in Arizona had urged the developer and the local officials to not plant oleander as a, as a vegetative screen, as oleander can be toxic to livestock. Nevertheless, when I visited, he walked me around and he showed me the oleander that was planted directly next to his property and where his livestock grazed. An additional concern has to do with residents being unaware of who is responsible for what stages of project development, construction, operation, and eventual decommissioning. The term developer gets used most often, but as many of us likely know, it's often not the developer who's responsible for certain actions and communication throughout the life cycle of a solar project. We need to remember the weight of the term developer and how it can be misinterpreted and misused in these communities. Finally, it should not come as a surprise that residents often had misunderstandings about different project attributes and objectives and sometimes exhibited beliefs uh, that appeared to be impacted by misinformation. You can see the one at the bottom of the screen about radiation and horses. I won't get into it, uh, but you can see it for yourself. Another concern associated with the process of solar development has to do with community subscription. There's often a great deal of support for community subscription, particularly in areas with high electricity rates. And as one local official in Texas noted, these residents positively perceive the opportunities to, to, excuse me, to subscribe to their local project. However, what we also saw was that the low population density around projects makes community subscription efforts not only expensive, but inefficient and results in few opportunities for local or project adjacent residents to participate in subscription. Not only were neighbors unaware of subscription offers, but one, one official identified that subscription had basically been an afterthought. And even one of the develop excuse me, even one of the develop developers that we spoke with 
identified that they may cease relying on a third-party subscription company due to the lack of local subscriptions that they only learned about after speaking with us. While third-party software and companies are used to fulfill subscriptions and do so effectively in potentially distant areas, which often end up being urban areas or areas that lack the space necessary to build solar, and thus makes them effective in meeting low to middle income requirements of many energy justice focused policies and efforts, the lack of subscription efforts close to projects may end up negatively impacting project support. At the same time, it's important to note that focusing the subscriptions on the communities that do live adjacent to the project may ultimately discriminate against those low and middle income and environmental justice communities that live further away and in urban areas that don't have those opportunities. I want to note that this is especially tricky and it's a challenge uh, going forward. How to strike that balance. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to impact concerns. Let's begin by talking about the concerns associated with the direct and the indirect economic impacts of projects. One thing that became clear across many of our projects was that residents lack an awareness of and understanding of the tax revenue generated by projects. This is a great quote by a developer. I'm going to read it in full. There just isn't the money in the project to build a new school or something. It's not like the way an old coal power plant was where it would come in and there would be 500 permanent jobs, super boost the tax revenue. Solar just doesn't do that. The money's not there in those projects to do that. And it's one of the unfortunate things about our energy transition, which is making people understand that that is the case. Like if you're used to that last big energy project that built you a new school, solar's just not gonna do that. Instead of tax revenue, residents appear to be more aware of landowner payments and the indirect economic impacts that are associated with local employment resulting from solar development. This includes local electricians and landscapers receiving contracts and economic activity at local stores and hotels and restaurants increasing. One last thing to note is that residents didn't always perceive the use of federal tax subsidies to support large-scale solar development positively often associating those subsidies with solar's inability to compete fairly with fossil fuel power generation. But perhaps more important than the direct and indirect economic impacts are concerns associated with the visual and landscape impacts that accompany solar development. We can't stress enough the impact that focusing on the aesthetic and landscape fit and minimizing the environmental and visual impacts associated with projects can have on residents' perceptions. I want to use one example in particular. A local official we spoke to in Michigan went above and beyond in demanding that an out-of-state developer used crush rocks as a base rather than simply build the project atop existing broken concrete and weeds. He did this because he said he was a member of the community and he didn't want to, in his words, have to dodge people at the store. That type of attention and yes, potentially greater cost and potentially greater time and construction may ultimately lead to increased long-term support for projects. Here we also show the design elements like fencing and screening and landscaping greatly affect resident support. Different fence designs and the placement of fence and the extent to which fencing fits in with the landscape are all important considerations. I'm now seeing why the title of our paper is Good Fences Make Good, Good Neighbors. And I wanna give a shout out to Joe for coming up with that title. One project we visited had different types of fencing around different sections of the project, which some residents believed that the fencing used near their residence was of inferior quality or less cost compared to other fencing. There are, of course, a host of alternative designs that can be used instead of chain link fencing. And even though some of these types of fencing may increase cost in the difficulty of projects, they appear to be positively perceived by project adjacent neighbors. Of course, there are different concerns associated with agrivoltaic projects and pollinator habitats, which were positively per perceived by some and negatively by others based on whether or not residents had been informed about or frankly understood what they were looking at. Another concern that became apparent as we visited these sites was the visual impact of interconnection infrastructure, meaning the substations, the overhead lines, and the pylons associated with each project. While arrays tend to get the bulk of our attention, at least my academic colleagues, we tend to spend a lot of time on that. It's often those elements that are far more visible, often visible from miles away from the project. Additionally, interconnection details are not always provided to officials, and officials sometimes lacked the understanding of what utilities would need to connect projects, resulting in duplicative effort that also greatly increased the visual impact. You can see the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, 
uh, a planning official took actually Ben and I around and showed us this. And this was an effort that actually required uh, double polls because the planning officials didn't understand what was going to be required by the officials and the developers hadn't communicated clearly what was necessary. So if we're trying to reduce a visual impact, obviously that's not a great effort to do so, having to duplicate those efforts. I also wanted to provide some visuals of some of the projects that we visited at the same time, ensuring that you couldn't actually tell which of the projects were which and which ones we visited. And so you can see the visual impact of at least the interconnection infrastructure here, which if you can't tell are often seen for miles. Uh, the, the picture on the left-hand side of the screen is actually a great effort to shield the infrastructure from view. You can't see it in the photo, but just in front and to the left of the, uh, of the utility pole is a, a, a section of forest and you couldn't actually see the substation from the road passing in front. So the, the developers actually did a great job with that project. You can also see that despite the efforts of local officials or project operators to maintain the landscape, excuse me, the landscaping, the amount of weeds or vegetation varied considerably. Many of these, these projects were quite large, over 100 megawatts uh, large and many hundreds of acres. And you could see that some were, were uh, handled better than others, even at sites where uh, the city manager was very uh, adamant about making sure that the site was kept very neat. Uh, even he identified that it was difficult to get landscapers to weed underneath the panels. And you can see some of the, uh, some of the weeds there on the right-hand side of the screen. In addition to the fencing, vegetation, and interconnection infrastructure, Residents often reported the noise associated with project construction, road construction, and increased traffic as significant and often negative impacts. That noise could last for months, so it's important to talk both about the noise of operation and the noise of construction, which are quite different. The noise associated with inverters was also discussed at sites, with one developer noting that project neighbors had complained about the noise of inverters at one of their sites, which were ultimately required them to retrofit the project. At another project, an official identified that the inverters were nearly silent, identifying that the inverter basically sounded like a bunch of bees. Another serious concern was noted with respect to solar projects taking agricultural land out of production. This concern was widespread and was noted even amongst supporters of projects. At the same time, some supporters identified that solar was key to sustaining degraded farmland and farmers' operations. While agrivoltaic projects were often spoke of, spoken about fondly, one supporter of a project in Colorado noted that the agrivoltaic project had taken a hay field out of production, which they said was important as they had animals that relied on that hay. At the same time, one landowner and local official in Iowa noted the benefits of using solar on degraded farmland. And I'll quote them. I was very enthused because we have a lot of farmers that have some ground that's not so favorable for crops. They're struggling. And with this coming in here, this project coming in here, they got up to $650 to $850 an acre, maybe more to not grow crops. I look at solar as farming. They're growing fuel basically by the sun's rays, not hurting our ground and taking some land that's not so productive and turning it into something that we can all benefit from. It's gonna lower our dependence on oil and coal and there's always gonna be energy in the sun. Less concerns were noted with respect to those projects that were built on previously developed or disturbed land and innovative sites like agrivoltaic projects. One official in Texas noted that every city has a landfill and almost every landfill is in a community like this, which happened to be a low and middle income community. And so if you can do this here, you can do it anywhere. Another official in a different state noted that community members had supported the development because it eradicated the blight that it had been before, basically a torn up ground with graffiti on the fencing and fencing torn down in certain areas. Yet despite the preference for brownfield development, it was clear that this type of development is complex, expensive, and a number of people said that it just wasn't widespread enough to meet clean energy goals. Developers identified that they needed more involvement from local and state officials and utilities to develop these brownfield sites, and the projects require greater experience, more permits, and more collaboration. Planners and officials, on the other hand, identified that they too needed more information and identified that brownfield remediation and reclamation created significant challenges in building those types of projects. Residents also noted serious concerns about the environmental impacts associated with solar projects. A number of residents in Arizona identified concerns about local temperatures increasing after their local project had been constructed. One said that the temperature had gone up so much that the trees don't get a frost now over there and they've died. Well, while evidence for that may be, may be, may be lacking, 
Uh, there were perhaps more evidence-based concerns about the impacts of projects to local flora and fauna. And a project in Arizona, excuse me, a project in Arizona did require the removal of a number of mesquite trees, which had been used for shade. One woman I spoke with was a runner, and she said that her typical route now lacked that shade. And officials in Florida were concerned about the impacts of a project to gopher tortoises and alligators that had previously populated the swamps nearby. Additionally, concerns about water resources and stormwater management and water withdrawals for cleaning panels were also noted. Despite the significant impact to climate change mitigation of solar, climate change was rarely a priority for most of the residents we spoke to. One official in Colorado noted, climate change, not many people care about that, unfortunately, while another official in Colorado identified how important it was to communicate the impacts of climate change to these project's neighbors. My piece of this is telling the narrative of the story of this part of the American farmer right, and it's just not good right now. It's not looking so good. And it's continuing, it's continuing to get harder with the, within the context of climate change. A final category of concerns associated with the impacts of projects had to do with the rural urban divide. This was noted in residents identifying the concerns or at least confusion about where the power generated by these projects was ultimately used. Rural residents often framed electricity as a natural resource that they were sharing, sometimes against their will, with distant urban residents. One interesting area for future study may be why rural residents see electricity different from the crops they also share with those same urban residents. Additionally, while brownfields and development on capped landfills were often preferred by urban residents, there were concerns about how that land was used in rural areas. One developer identified that rural landfills, landfills are often not fenced or gated, and people sometimes use them for recreation, either as an ATV park or perhaps for riding dirt bikes, Perhaps they're out there hunting, and so you may get opposition to some of those projects on those disturbed lands. At the same time, solar was also seen by some as a way of reducing suburbanization, urban sprawl, and maintaining low density. An official in Rhode Island identified solar as a passive temporary land use that ultimately prevented what would become of much of the land in his jurisdiction, i.e. subdivisions. Finally, it's important to consider the influx of workers necessary to build large projects and the impacts that that influx can have on rural economies and rural communities. One local official identified the challenge of so many workers suddenly being in a rural community. I, and to quote, I think this is where we needed to do, excuse me, I think this is where we needed to do a little bit better, excuse me, I think this is where we needed to do a little bit better when they got up at the end of the day. It was 300 people leaving work into a community that was already busy enough. We couldn't keep up with milk and we didn't keep up with the beverages and the snacks and the gas. So it made the stores busier and it made some local people upset because they couldn't buy bread. What the heck, we can't keep bread anymore. I can't keep milk in here. You can see how that may upset a typically quiet rural community. This takes us to research question two. What strategies have developers and officials employed or could employ to improve perceptions and project outcomes and better align large scale solar development with local land use plans, community needs and values? Most of these recommendations flow directly from the concerns identified in research, excuse me, in research question one. For instance, more direct engagement with large scale solar neighbors and community residents would be really beneficial. This could include bus tours, classes with residents focused on job training, having coffee, excuse me, having coffee with neighbors, regular meetings with community advisory groups, door knocking, providing visuals and narratives explaining and seeking feedback regarding the process, design elements, and potential outcomes of development. All of these strategies were noted by participants across our sites as being really important. And developers and other officials both agree that the most important thing the, in, excuse me, the most important thing in the process is making sure the community is brought in as well as getting community buy-in. One of the ways of doing that may be, may be to use local third-party intermediaries as liaisons. Both officials and developers identified the projects would benefit from re relying on a local partner that was able to speak the local dialect, knew the people, and understood the community's values, priorities, and concerns. In particular, community champions were recommended, meaning grassroots leaders that could get the word out about a project and could work with the local community to address concerns from the developer's side. At the same time, it was often urged that, li that liaisons should work specifically on behalf of the community and make sure to advocate lead collaboration efforts and in particular, 
hold developers and owner operators feet to the fire. Another strategy was to improve, per, excuse me, another strategy to improve perceptions and outcomes is to share success stories, as well as explicitly identify the opportunity costs of certain decisions with respect to development. One official noted how important narratives, describing successful examples, and communicating project details, development processes, and future impacts were. At the same time, noting that not everyone is a skilled communicator, and there needs to be storytellers, and that some farmers may not necessarily be that. Though I will say that most farmers I know are actually great storytellers and are happy to tell you a story. Additionally, the opportunity costs of certain decisions should, could be better communicated. For instance, that large setbacks often become unutilized land, which may ultimately upset leaseholders and community, excuse me, community members later on in the project. One strategy that's likely to increase support is encouraging local economic benefits and subscription carve-outs for projects. Local parts suppliers, electrical contractors, food service providers, all could be more meaningfully included into the solar development process. Additionally, community subscription can generate support for projects, especially if it includes meaningful opportunities for participation. And of course, community benefits agreements are a great way to include more significant tangible benefits for local residents. So in conclusion, this study engaged a diverse group of stakeholders at seven unique large-scale solar, site, solar sites across the US. Across those sites, stakeholders consistently identified aspects of the development process and project impacts that meaningfully influenced how they perceived the success or the failure of those projects. Despite six of the seven projects being completed and thus perhaps thought of as successful, we argue that the definition of success should, should broaden to encompass aligning with local values of, ensuring beneficial outcomes for, and in earning support from local host communities. And not just in the short run to obtain construction permits, but throughout operation of the project, something we call community-centered solar development. Such support requires attention to process and impact and may benefit from the strategies identified here that hopefully work to improve alignment of development with local land use plans and community values and objectives. So I will stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Again, I want to acknowledge the folks at CEDO for supporting this work and provide the citation and the hyperlink to the paper, which is open access, so it's freely available to you all. Fantastic, Doug, thanks for the presentation. And we did have a, a few questions trickling into the q and I think uh, my colleague Ben Hohen is gonna help us uh, moderate the Q&A. Um, so yes, yeah, kick it off. I am ready. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, the, it's been asked a number of times whether this these slides and this recording will be available uh, after the fact, and the answer is yes, it will. There is a project landing page. I will paste that again into the chat for everyone. So um, please submit your questions. We do have uh, time here to answer a few, so um, take your time to submit them into the Q&A window. Uh, I think the first question I'll ask, uh, Doug, that that uh, you did touch on a little bit, but maybe you could provide some more nuance to, is um, a little bit more about the loss in at and farmland in the ag economy. Uh, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you got some feedback on that. Uh, that sometimes it's good and. Uh, Sometimes it's not so good, but if you could provide any additional information or nuance around that particular finding. So with respect to the, specifically to the economic impact of solar in rural communities, is that what you're asking about? I, sorry, I can't see the question. I guess I could open the questions. To see no, that. that's, that's what the question was. Uh, what about the other economic impacts, uh, such as loss of farmland resulting in the loss uh, of, of the ag economy? That was the way it was questioned. Yeah, so that's a great question. And what I'm going to try to do in responses to, the, is to, to responses to these questions is only answer what I learned from these interviews. So we have done, I mean, I know even members of the CCSD team are working on that right now. And we've asked questions in the task two survey. And I know there are parallel research efforts going on examining exactly answers to that question. Within the interviews themselves, I don't have a whole lot more nuance to add on that question. It came up briefly in interviews, but we didn't go 
I didn't have a chance to go into great, much greater detail with respect to those economic impacts. So at least with respect to these interviews, we really only, uh, we really only uh, had a surface level discussion about those. So I don't want to say anything more than what we learned about in these interviews. Got it. Um, did you spot any demographic or political trends that maybe were not mentioned today uh, in your interviews? So uh, again, I'm going to try to do a good job of not uh, maybe uh, saying more than I can. We did not ask demographic questions, partly because it would be uncomfortable and frankly inappropriate in a lot of these uh, in a lot of these places to ask those questions. So I can't speak to whether or not people were more conservative or liberal. I certainly had a sense of whether they were more conservative or more liberal in some of their responses, but I can't identify whether they were. I would I would guess that many of the folks we spoke with, particularly around the larger projects that were in rural areas, were more conservative than not. Some of the spoke some of the folks we spoke with in Colorado, which should not be a huge surprise, uh, did appear to skew more liberal and some of them offered that they were more liberal. So you know, I don't want to I don't want to sit I don't want to necessarily, you know, misidentify somebody as being conservative or liberal based on their responses to the questions. But I often it seemed pretty straightforward to tell that many of the folks were at least the residents, the neighbors were more conservative than others. OK. Um... And sorry, just to follow up on that, that's one of the things we're looking at in the task two survey. So we should have more information about that. Uh, as we do ask them about their demographics and we can dig a little bit deeper into that connection. Yeah, that's a great point. So there are some additional questions about the subscription model. Obviously, these are interesting findings to, to note that um, in some cases, individuals were not reached uh, around projects, uh, even though that project had a community subscription for the output. Um, there's some questions about whether that kind of response occurred around some of the larger projects. Um, so it's sort of a two-part question. Are you aware of community descriptions occurring around larger projects? And do you have any feedback uh, that you collected for those projects as it relates to community subscription? Okay, so I'm really glad this question was asked. Number one, again, with respect to the interviews we did and the sites that we studied, there were no large projects. So large meaning anywhere from, I would say anything greater than 10 megawatts. Most of the sites, in fact, the two sites that had subscription were large or smaller sites. One was, uh, well, I don't wanna say what they were. Um, so they were smaller sites that offered subscription. And the sense was that the developers I don't even want to say that the developers or the operators didn't, it was just simply too difficult to actually go around, in their words, it was too difficult to go around and try to sign up subscribers surrounding these projects because the density was simply too low or it was just too inefficient to do it in person. Really, that's what it was about. It was the in-person communication that simply took too much time and effort and was too costly. And it was much easier to rely on a third party entity that used online campaigns and, you know, and websites to sign up uh, individuals that were el that were somewhere else in the utility service area. And oftentimes were in low and middle income communities or in urban communities where they, you know, where we want to sign people up as well. It was much more quick and efficient to do it that way. I don't know of larger projects that are in rural communities that are doing it differently. I don't want to say they're not doing it. I just don't know of any where that's actually occurring. I would love to see a project where they're actually going out and speaking with people or doing a better job at the local, uh, in the permitting process or in the local meetings, making subscription and offer to locals uh, that live near nearer the project. At this, I also want to say at the same time, if it wasn't clear, you know, there are some concerns about that effort being discriminatory because some of the benefits of subscription is making sure that you can sign up individuals that live in areas where these types of projects aren't possible. So it's this very tricky space where we want to include folks that don't have the opportunity and might be in low and middle income communities. But at the same time, if we're using subscription to generate support for a local project, particularly in a rural area, we do want to make sure that those individuals also have an opportunity to subscribe. And at least the projects we visited, not met, I mean, we didn't run into anybody that knew subscription was an op was a was an option. Great. Thank you very much. So a uh, question uh, about how you identified the different 
uh, categories of respondent, you know, farmers, ag landowners, different types of stakeholders, and whether you saw any similarity or differences between them as a whole. Um, so with respect to what we categorized as residents, and that could be uh, that could be farmers, that could be uh, homeowners, that could be uh, renters and apartment buildings. I mean, they were all categorized the same way, at least uh, in the in the table in which we identify them here. With respect to how they perceive the project, again, I'm I mean, I'm hesitant to kind of extrapolate out because keep in mind this is only 54 individuals across seven projects. So I'm hesitant to say, Farmers see it this way, landowners see it this way, renters see it this way. Um, I want to answer that question, but I'm going to hold off on that. Again, I think we could we should wait till the task two survey is analyzed and presented. I think we'll know more about demographics and the types of residents uh, that that we uh, elicited question or elicited a response from. I think we'll be able to say more about it at that point, but I'm hesitant to do it now because the sample's small. This is, yeah, I'll stop there. That's great, uh, thank you. And just a note to everyone listening, there is a Q&A window. If you don't mind submitting your questions in that window versus the chat window, it's just a little easier to address them on that side. So sorry about those that have delivered asked questions in the, in the chat window, we might not be able to get to them. Um, Doug, were there any community benefits that really stuck out to you as engaging and meaningful to people? You know, what, what did people seem to notice that was was positive about the projects and and uh, you know, looking across those 54 uh, yeah. um with respect to explicit direct economic impacts from the projects, uh, it was difficult to find residents that were aware of what those impacts were. Um when I spoke with local officials and developers, most talked about the tax revenue benefits, um, but there weren't, there wasn't discussion from residents about what the impacts were, other than the indirect economic activity, uh, it, it, which which entailed basically more business around town, so more uh, more activity at the local restaurants, um, uh, hotels. Uh, there were there were occasions where the local hardware store would basically run out of things because the developer for whatever reason would run out of a particular item and would need to go get it. Um, and so those things were noticed, but, um, oh, and I just forgot, I was gonna say something, I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, uh, with respect to landscaping contracts, that was definitely brought up at most of the sites we talked about. Most of the landscaper, landscapers were local, though what it means to be local is is not necessarily clear because some of these landscapers had very large contracts and maybe would be uh, handling the landscaping at multiple projects. And some of those projects could be an hour or two away from each other. So yes, they're local in that they're regional, but they may not necessarily be from the actual community in which the project was built. Uh, same thing with electrical contractors. So those tended to be local, but again, local as in regional, not necessarily local from the town uh, in which the project was built. So, yeah. Got it. Excellent. Um, just a quick question here. When you mentioned subscriptions, are you referring to community participation or uh, for the output of the project or to own a portion of the project? Uh, community participation. So subscribing to to the output. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, did you run into anyone in the community that received any compensation or subsidy on their electricity bill? And if so, what were their comments? Uh, nobody received us. We did not talk with anybody that received a subsidy on their bill. We did speak with uh, a few people that received compensation from the project. And uh, as I said, I think around the uh information provision they were they did uh, they did perceive the project positively so most of the folks that received i will i can say that the people we spoke with uh that did receive compensation for the project perceived it positively um and said that opportunities to participate in the planning and the permitting process were ample and that they felt that it was a fair process um again that's something that we want to delve a little bit deeper into in the survey uh and did delve into a little bit deeper in the survey um, yeah, the numbers weren't, we just didn't have the numbers here to really be able to say anything, you know, more than that. 
There's a good question here. Uh, I, I know that this is not going to be something you can answer <laughs> for the questioner. My but favorite kind of question. Yeah. I mean, actually, I will just note that a lot of the questions here are, are saying, well, what do we do now? Uh, how do we develop better? How do we align projects with the community? Those sorts of things. And of course, that's not the goal here. This was really to sort of understand and collect information about the positives uh, and negatives of local projects so that they could be studied in future tasks. So I, I know it will be a little unsatisfying for, for the groups, but um, there- I can't hint, I can't, well, go ahead. Um, well, and please answer this however you, you feel like, but one of the comments that was asked was, you know, um, fighting, uh, coming into the project earlier is one thing that was mentioned by others, but of course that might provide more notice so that individuals might have more time to fight the project. Um, you know, obviously that would be one downside to early community engagement. And there's there's a balance there, right? And so any thoughts on that balance between the ability for opposition to organize and fight the project versus uh, allowing people to participate in the planning in that process and therefore be more accepting of it? Yeah, I mean, this comes up a lot, not just with this project, but with a lot of the projects that we work on about what, you know, at what point, if you open discussion and engagement too early, and I and we had some developers identify that we they, they don't necessarily want to do that if a project isn't even going to go forward because it might cause a lot of distress in the community for nothing because the project isn't going to move forward. I, I I think, and yes, we actually had, I know I'm running out of time, we actually had residents say exactly that, that had they known about the project earlier, they would have organized in opposition to it. I don't think you're going to win over those those folks. They're going to they're going to be opposed to the project no matter what. But I do think there is a sizable proportion of the community that were they to be informed earlier and were they to have more opportunities to engage in person with developers and talk about their concerns and what they want out of a project, my suspicion is that they would perceive that project more favorably. We're again, we're looking into that. I don't know, but I, some of those people you're just not going to win over and yeah you're going to open it up earlier to them opposing because they'll know about it earlier but I, I don't think that should that shouldn't mean we don't engage early or often because we're worried about that well thanks doug especially and i also want to thank everyone for attending and um, really participating actively in in this q a um, i am going to just wrap it up now as we're at the top of the hour um, but thanks again for attending. And as a reminder, you can find these slides uh, and a link to the journal article publication. Uh, and as well, we'll be releasing a, um, a recording of the webinar soon on, on the website that we've shared via the chat. Thanks again for attending and please do stay in touch as we release more work from this CCSD project. Thank thanks you. Again. Take care.